you had a band called The Boys. Was that the mid seventies? Yeah, they were originally uh, sort of like the New York Dolls, but like actual better maybe technique. <laughs> but we were uh, glam, and so it was outfits and, and a lot of a lot of firepower, a lot of lights and flash pots and all that stuff. We were very loud. It was kind of our thing. We were the loudest band, but we ended up burning our band room down with our pyro. So that was the end of that band. That's why the the band ended? Well, that version of it. One bit of cool history is that Gene Simmons was actually coming to see the boys when he discovered Van Halen. Van Halen was opening for you guys? No, we were opening for them. Okay. Van Halen, they had the momentum. They were the kings. They had David Lee. We didn't have David Lee. We had a good singer, but it wasn't David Lee. I wasn't Eddie. I was still developing, and our songs weren't quite together like theirs were to say the least and you know everything they were the kings and it went the way it should have went but um we were just one of the bands in la trying to do what everybody was trying to do at that time it was really a uh, really uh, wonderful colorful time to be in a rock band but uh yeah gene gene saw us at the at Gazzari's and liked us and and came to see us again at the star at the starwood but i did read somebody sent me a a little blurb in his in the book about he just basically said we suck. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh, that's yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, it wasn't our best show, but we didn't. I don't know, we suck, but whatever. Did um, you guys get close to a deal at all? No, we ran around with a couple of fly by night fake manager types and did all kinds of goofy jumping through hoops, but never amounted to anything. We did a demo tape. Um, did a couple demo tapes. Uh, the first one we did was actually at uh, Sound City, believe it or not. friend had, I think it was like, knew a janitor there or something and got us in for free, quietly, from midnight to 7 in the morning during the dark time. Nobody knew about it. We did it on the sly, and we got in. We had to do all three or four songs in seven hours, record and mixed. And you recorded I, on that Neve board? Did they have that at that point? Oh, yeah. We didn't realize what we where we were but it was kind uh, of a shithole though too right the uh, appearance uh, of it very 70s kind of stinky and but yeah, fuck dude it's that's the vibe was just oozing off the walls it, that place that you couldn't make it sound bad uh and it's still actually uh, in operation but unfortunately without its heart and brain which is the board the magic board so uh that's unfortunate but i, I actually go by there Occasionally, I do some work in that center. But I did I did a record there with Lynch Mob. Uh, remember which record? One of the last records we did. So we were, I think, kind of like one of the last bands in there. It was right after Metallica did their record. They were in there for a couple of months, and I know they were just mopping up, and then we moved in. So it was kind of ironic. It's like the first place I ever recorded, and one of the, and then I recorded there just right before they they went under. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a full circle thing, but I remember being in there just is that sound. I remembered that from all those decades ago. I, oh, this sounds like home. Eddie was an influence on you, correct? Absolutely. Was Randy Rhodes an influence? No, not really. Eddie was an influence on Randy as well. You think Randy was definitely influenced by Eddie? Oh, yeah. He couldn't help it. And uh, I think everybody went to locally here, went through their Eddie phase because he was such a just had such a major impact and made such, such a giant impression on everybody and specific guitar players specifically that uh, it was like game over. It was just like what was like when Pete Townsend and Jimmy Page and all them went down to watch Hendrix. Uh, hey, look at this guy from America's, you know, playing the club. You want to go see him and had their faces melted. It was that kind of thing. So, yeah, he changed everything. His paradigm shift and in, in the whole way we understood ourselves and our relation to the, to the guitar and and, uh, the hierarchy and all that. So yeah, Eddie was Eddie was setting the bar for sure. With Quiet Riot, you weren't a fan, not really, because I, I thought Randy was really just channeling uh, Mick Ronson, uh, which is I love Mick Ronson, he's a genius. But um, people kind of and we all have our influences, but it's like he, he was very heavily imaged, mirrored Mick Ronson, and then he was a very deep guitar player, but I didn't think he translated, at least early on with Fire Riot, didn't tr that didn't translate as well with the rock music. But if you were to sit down with Randy with a nylon string guitar, 
he was a very deep player and, and had a, just a deep reservoir of knowledge and he just played beautifully, very accomplished um, and impressive. But later years, it, it did kind of gel and, and you did the records with Ozzy, of course, and undeniably um, unique, wonderful. But um, back when we were in the clubs, it hadn't quite gotten there yet. And neither had I. <laughs> we were all kind of just learning and trying to evolve to where we were, didn't know where we were going to end up, but you know who we were destined to be.